policies related to scholarships, educational and training privileges, permits and licenses for the opening of trade and business, land and housing, the corporate equity market, etc. etc. Its tentacles extend into practically every sphere of life, economic, social, administrative, even cultural and religious. Now, racism in Malaysia has not, in the last 50 years, remained idle or stagnant. But it has developed into a subtle, sometimes crude, pervasive and increasingly aggressive form, especially in its institutionalized manic manifestation. Now, as the organizers of this forum have noted, the political, legal and administrative structures of our country the anchors and props of this institutionalization needs may need to be fundamentally revamped. For this to happen, the public view of what is truly happening must become sharper. This is not an, not an easy task, given the resources at hand and the determination of the supporters and beneficiaries of racism in Malaysia to muzzle any effort, any attempt at opening up public discourse and opening up discussion on this subject. Therefore, I must congratulate Hindra and the Civil Rights Committee of the KL and Slangor Chinese Assembly Hall for taking up this effort to consult with the public, with uh, distinguished uh, speakers, and to address this, what is still regarded by many as a taboo, an ultra-sensitive topic in the public sphere. According to them, this is the first of a series of fora to highlight and educate about the structures and processes that entrench racism in our system, the impact to the nation, to us, to our children, and to the future of this country if it's left unchecked. Now, I would like to uh, introduce uh, very quickly uh, the three speakers for tonight. And I'm going to uh, go over their CVs very quickly. But the Kwakia Sun on my uh, left is uh, well known to all of you. He's a uh, director of Swaram, received his uh, bachelor's uh, BA economics as well as PhD in sociology from Manchester uh, uh, University. He's taught at the University of Singapore in Sociology. Uh, he's better known, not for his uh, lecturing days, but uh, he was arrested under the ISA during Operation Lala in 1987 and was detained for 445 days without trial. Now, upon his release in 1989, he helped to found SORAM, the leading human rights organization in Malaysia. Um, I think I'll stop at that. He's got a lot of CV. Now, uh, our second... Uh, s s Welcome. Selamat. Welcome. I was going to introduce you in your absence. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Ganesan, uh, trained as an engineer, half his career has been spent working in uh, industry, the other half uh, as a uh, corporate consultant. From the year 2007, five years ago, he awakened from what he says was his slumber. He was awakened by the Hindraf rally and has become active in human rights work with Hindraf. He's secular in his political beliefs and he thinks that the country has significant opportunity for change. Our third speaker is uh, going to be uh, Dr. Azmi Sharo. He did not respond to my uh, emails for his CV, so I went into uh, Wikipedia and uh, Google, and this is what I've got. Um, he's an associate professor at uh, the Faculty of Law, University of Malaya. His uh, LLB honours is from University of Sheffield. His LLM is from Nottingham and his PhD is from uh, Suez. So a thoroughly British <laughs> educational background. 
Now, his area of expertise is in conflict of law and uh, Malaysian and international environment law. And um, of course, he's better known amongst uh, you, most of you here, for his column. To those of you who read the stuff, <laughs> Brave New World, which is a very highly regarded uh, column, and uh, he's also got a website. Uh, and I've noticed that uh, since 2008, his uh, annual uh, output in uh, the star has declined from 51 uh, articles in 2008 to uh, 20-something in 2009. <laughs> There's something wrong in the uh, tabulation uh, in your web page. Yes. <laughs> All right, now uh, to, to business then. Uh, we're going to have uh, the three speakers uh, all in a row, okay? Uh, so, so be patient with your questions and comments. I think uh, we'll have a more fruitful <coughs> and interactive discussion. Unless you have something really burning that you want to ask the uh, speaker that you can't wait, you know? Uh, I'm going to try to uh, get the speakers uh, say their piece, and then we'll have uh, a discussion. Is that all right with you? Yes. Thank you. Racism is morally wrong. It has to go. But 
It is not going to go by itself. It will go, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, it will go that when we as intellectuals stand up and contribute to changing social values in the country, among the community. At one time, if we had slavery, it was because it was socialization. It was okay. What's wrong with it? After all, they are savages. They are human beings. That was the social value. But today, that social value has changed significantly. And what do we say? How do we all view slavery? Not that slavery has gone completely away. The pernicious aspects have gone, but it's gone under cover, and it has lost social sanction. So my answer to the question is, yes, racism must go, racism will go, but it's not going to go on its own, it's going to go through effort like this and more. Where we educate the people, and once people are educated, social values change, politicians just follow. The laws then take care of themselves. Okay? So this is Hindra's contribution to progressing the social values. Okay, I'm going to uh, lay out first the case of institutionalized racism in the country. You know, much of what I speak about is, you know, daily occurrence for many of us, so it won't be exactly all new, but I'm going to lay out the case. And then I'm going to talk about some of the initiatives that, you know, we, Indra, with the limited resource, you know, of the core activists that we have, that we need up to, and uh, then talk a little bit about, okay, where do we go from here? Okay, okay first, as what uh, Dr. Lin said just now, the kind of racism that we have in our country is subtle, because anybody who comes into this country sees all the goodness around, will not agree with you if you say, you know, uh, there is a racist regime behind all this. It's subtle. It's pervasive. We know that. It pervades all aspects of our lives. We know that. And it's increasingly encroaching, aggressive. And as competition, as contention within the economy increases, we expect that it will get even more aggressive if left unchecked in the political, legal, and administrative structures of the country. And not only that, and this is Dr. Mahathir's contribution, in a craftily interwoven jigsaw of reinforcing practices. As you will see, I will present in a while. Okay, initially, at the inception of our nation, the uh, Malayan aristocracy at that time used of the Malay agenda. Today, an expanded, broadened Malay elite class usurps the entire Malaysian agenda. Okay? This is my postulate. These are my first two postulates. Right? I start from here. Now, compare with what we have in South Africa. Right? In South Africa, the uh, elite of the minority uh, race, the whites, 18% of the population in 1980, right, control the country. Here, it's not the minority, but it's the elite of the majority that controls. This is a significant difference and, and accounts for the difference in the nature of the racist regime. Because a lot of people cannot see the, the synonym there. Okay. Uh, the, because they were a minority race in South Africa, the whites needed overt and brash methods of control. Right? And we know all about that. Whereas over here, right, you don't need, because you know they already with the uh, with the infrastructure, they already are in control. What they need is to maintain that control. Subtle methods are used. The majority in South Africa had little leverage in the economy. However, in Malaysia, the minority has significant leverage within the economy. South African apartheid 
administration was manned entirely by whites. In 1977, 500,000 whites manned all the supervisory positions and above in the South African administration. And that's how policy was operationalized and control was maintained in day-to-day -day club. Malaysian administration is at least 85% Malay in uh, ethnic composition. Okay? Similarly, there are two education systems in South Africa, one for the whites and one for the blacks. We have two education systems in our country. I will show you a little bit more detail as we go, for Malays and for non-Malays. South, South Africa had you know, all these draconian laws to control with. And, you know, the, uh, uh, sorry, the Population Registration Act, which, which uh, classified into whites, blacks, coloreds, and Asians. We don't have an act like that, but equally, we have that practice. Wherever you go, whatever form you take up, that's what you have to fill up. Bangsa, yeah? Line line is another bangsa now. You know, you have three plus line line. Okay? Uh, and, and, and so on, you know, a number of uh, uh, acts. Malaysia, you know, for its part, has the Internal Security Act, the Publishing and Printing Presses Act, Official Secrets Act, the Seditions Act, the New Freedom of Assembly Act. All this to muscle any and all dissent in the country. Okay? Now, South African uh, uh, racism readily recognized as immoral, but not so with the racism that we have in our country. Okay, the vehicle. How has this come to be? It is, again, another postulate of ours. The Article 153 has been the vehicle for this to occur. Okay? And has, has resulted in a de facto two-tier citizenship in this country. We can argue the words, you know, we can argue, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the term. But the fact is, and you know, and that's what this, this, this uh, uh, forum is really all about, right? And it has, uh, sorry, it has provided the Malay elite with the vehicle for institutionalizing racism in Malaysia. Okay. Okay, I want to, uh, you know, just talk a little bit about the manifestations of institutionalization. As I said, the way it's entrenched in the political, legal, and administrative structures, yeah? In terms of the treatment that, you know, we uh, encounter or we receive whenever we meet up with the system. Treatment in state policies, there's a new economic policy, okay? Two objectives. One was to restructure society to eliminate identification of race with occupation, very noble. Eradication of poverty, very noble. But none of the uh, poverty eradication measures really reach the normal poor. None. Right? This, this was one, one leg of it. The other is the uh, elimination of identification of race with occupation. It eliminated maybe some, but it created others. Right? New identifications of race with occupation in key areas that required for the control of public policy leaders. By the way, they needed this. Right? So the administration, the judiciary, the armed forces, the police, the academia in public universities. Right? New identification of occupation with race. Why? Because this was needed to control public policy. Okay. Here are just you know, some statistics. May not be exactly you know, uh, new. But the interesting thing is this. You see how the control you know, in the uh, management group versus the middle group and the lower groups you know, within the uh, government administration, how it increases. And what this says basically is, um, you know, control entirely was 
was uh, taken up by the uh, elite control in Thailand. Yeah, there you have it. This was a key process to ensure absolute control over the national resource by the Malay elite. Okay, don't have to say much more about that. The ministers and the ministries control the eligibility for and award of these projects. We see that happening today. Feedlot, uh, uh, we call it Feedlot, Malaysian Feedlot Center. National, some, national feedlot. National feedlot. I have something to say about that in a moment. Okay. Yeah. So all the development programs, all excludes non-Malays, systematically, Felda, Felkra, Felda, Kekeda, Ketanga, all those state development agencies, you know, regional development agencies, land development agencies, all exclude systematically. And uh, the national resource is usurped cleverly through the workings of the interlaced activities of all these agencies, government linked companies, government investment companies, economic planning units, federal cabinet of ministers, and so on, all of that. Right? Very well interwoven network, the way they work. And, uh, uh, okay, I'm actually wanting to talk about the National Feedlot uh, Corporation because it clearly tells you how this whole thing works. I'll come to that in a moment. Okay, that is treatment uh, in state policies. Now, treatment by the police. Now, being from Hindra, this is not anything uh, new for us. We are all the time hounded by the police. Not because they're doing anything wrong, but because they're doing something right. And they don't want that. You see, all that I'm saying, if any of you can say I'm telling a lie, then you're right, the police are after us for a good reason. But we talk about the issues of the Indian poor, Indian marginalized. Right? And, uh, okay, uh, Okay, I am a little bit ahead, but okay, the point here is that okay, there's a significant uh, underclass that has developed as a result of the, uh, the policies of the past. Significant underclass among the Indians. And uh, worst forms of human rights violations are occurring against these, um, you know, like we have well-known one case, Kukan, but we have so many others shot because they're suspected, or killed in custody, right? And, uh, and in our opinion, this is happening because they are soft targets. Soft targets, you know, minority, and uh, nobody will speak up for them. Okay. Yeah, that's in uh, custody, killed. You know, the story goes like this. The suspect was acting suspiciously. There was a car chase. And then, uh, you know, they fired at us. <coughs> then we fired back. Then we went and opened up their boat and we saw parangs and guns in there. This is, next time there's a shooting, you just read the story. It'll always fall within this, uh, what I'm saying here. Okay? So minorities again. How about by the police? Okay? Again, more than 60% of the inmates in Malaysian prisons are of Indian origin. So if you're having so many uh, you know, custodial deaths, you can imagine how many of them will be of uh, Indian descent. Okay, treatment by the judicial system. The judicial system is part of the bullying infrastructure to keep the minority down. We, we say particularly the Indians because of their soft targets. Okay? Hindra activists are hounded for any show of defiance. Recently, I don't know how many of you are aware, on the 27th of February 2011, we called for a march against UMNO's racism, solidarity march of the people against UMNO's racism. Right? A few thousand people tried to get through to KLCC. 109 
uh, in our estimate, were arrested. 54 are being prosecuted, and they're still being prosecuted. Right? Now, let's say you had how many? 60 people, 61 people arrested? How many of them are being prosecuted? Now, how many of you know how many of them are being prosecuted? Why are the Hindra activists being prosecuted? Okay. Again, for no more than defined. Uh, judicial system, uh, Kampong Medan murders, not investigated in spite of repeated attempts to get the attention of the courts. Okay. And uh, there are many cases where now people entangled between their religion and Islam, you know, are, uh, you know, because they're non-Muslims, they uh, appeal to the civil courts, but the civil courts, you know, advocating their responsibility and handing over to the Sharia courts. In that sense, the Sharia courts are actually, in, in, in the constitution, Sharia courts are uh, inferior courts. The superior courts basically should adjudicate on these matters for the non-Muslims, but in, increasingly the inferior courts are encroaching into the area of the civil and superior courts. Yeah. By the media, we don't have to say this, we don't have to say, you know, much, we, you know, I'm just making this one point, the Malay proverb, the media is given free hand to speak for the racist policies of the government. In the education system again, you know, I mean, we know this, we know this, okay. As I said, two education systems, two education systems, right, underfunded primary schools for non-Malays, SPM pre-university exams, private universities for most of them, small number in public universities, limited scholarship support. So what this says is, you go find your education on your own. That's what this says, if you look at all of that. Right? Underfunded, go get the funds, if you can. Right? On the other side, we have Pramata Kindis, well-funded SRK primary school, MRSN, matriculation free university programs, overseas university prep programs, Mara University, other public universities, scholarship support. This is the truth. Maybe a little bit, you know, uh, you know, sensitive for me to say, but it is the truth. Okay, and uh, this is a rare occasion when we get some statistics, 2011. This is the uh, student population distribution, ethnic distribution, right? I just, sorry, I just want to point out, you know, the uh, minority representation, right? I, for my part, want to just, you know, take this, Indians, 2.57%, right? I mean, we can say the same for every one of the other categories, but I take this. We have overseas students, 5.4%. Who are these overseas students? I guess, you know, when big business goes abroad and needs to, uh, you know, to uh, do corporate citizenship in those countries, probably, you know, for that purpose of the elite, right? But the people of this country, you know, if, if we go by quota systems, 22,000 Indian students should have got places in the universities. Let's say they get, uh, it costs 100,000 uh, piece for a degree, right? That's 22 billion a year that has to be forked out by Indian parents who are already in impoverished states. Okay. okay. So basically, as a result, I, I cannot postulate. As a result of this institutionalized racism, one of the effects has been entrapping okay, and abandoning the Indian poor in, a, in poverty, in a trap of poverty, right? Resulting in this position and marginalization. Okay? Now, had there not been institutionalized racism, I postulate again, right, there would have been good foundational education for the young Indian children. Program movement around the estates for the displaced workers. Adequate opportunities provided in the agricultural sector. Adequate training and post-secondary school education opportunities. A path to adjust to the new social and physical environment. All these did not happen. The path for crime would not have been the sole path for upward mobility for many of the Indian young. There would have been a path to move out from illiteracy, semi-illiteracy, where there's a lot, 
ignorance and vulnerability to productive and robust roles in society, not wasted languishing in prisons or in peddling drugs. Effectively, the Indian poor will join the mainstream and lead a life of dignity and of hope and contribute positively to the realization of a greater nation. But that is not to be. Racism denies equality, and whenever equality is denied, everything else goes with it. There is no dignity where there is no equality. Okay, so put all of that together, we join the dots. Okay? First, we have an ethnocentric political system, which is 50% plus one, and you get to rule the country. Okay? And that result has resulted in 54 years of uninterrupted UMNO rule. Okay? And uh, couple that with the two key citizenship and trends in the federal constitution, Article 153, a key factor that provided the vehicle to usurp the national agenda. UMNO developed its Katwanan Malayu doctrine and all the other structures. Other communities remain from that one. Okay? And entrenches racism. In the 54 years, we have an EP, employment almost completely excludes normally in the, you know, uh, those sectors. Decision making in the administration is right in the hands of the elite. Dissent kept in check by the prisons, the laws, the attorneys general, the judges, and threats from politicians. And Islamism allowed to develop to emphasize the malayness of the elite's constituency needed for the self-preservation of the elite. Increasing erosion, resulting in increasing erosion of religious rights of minority and entrenching racism, usurpation of the national resource and marginalization of minorities. Okay, this is what I was, you know, ready to get to. Uh, National Deadlock Center. You see how this whole thing comes together in this example. I'm not so concerned about the scandal, about them not making money or them losing money. It's more the, in, the, the instance itself. This is one instance we get to see, but there's only one instance we get to see. This is the tip of the iceberg, okay? Now, let me just go through it. Okay, EPU and Prime Minister. This was a high-impact project, by the way. Only a, a Prime Minister decides. Right? I guess with the economic planning unit, right? And Dr. Dr. Mohammed Sali Ismail, who heads the company, was formerly head of the technology park. Right? And who incidentally only happens to be the husband of the minister. Coincidence. Yeah. Just pure coincidence. Okay? Okay. So I wonder what they talk about. Okay? And then uh, he says, he flatly says, no, they don't talk about these things. Okay. And then, uh, uh, interesting thing, there was, an, uh, there was an interview, and in the interview, the uh, 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 Dr. Dr. Mohammad Sali Ismail says, you know, my children were studying in the United States, and they were working there, and I had to convince them to come back and take up these positions because the, the, the country has given you the your opportunity, now come back and pay back. What opportunity is he talking about? <laughs> so what opportunity? He, the scholarships that went that took them to the American University, I would guess. Yes, yes, yes. I, I don't know this for a fact, but I would think so. I can give it in writing. <laughs> Actually, I don't need it in writing. Okay. All right. So, and then at the time that this was, uh, at the time that this was approved, Mohiri Yasin was the agricultural minister, right? And he was vice president of AMNO, vying to become the deputy president of AMNO. And uh, Charizard, you know, was Manita here, and guess what, you know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, uh, okay, Bank Portania, uh, I don't know this for a fact again, but I venture because there was some meeting with Bank Portania. So Bank Portania is probably the financier for the 250 million in soft loans, right? 2%, I understand. Uh, of which I think they bought uh, 200 million for I don't know how many million, and the uh, return is 12%. Good business, right? Right. right. And they were granted 5,000 acres of land for the project. Now, here, yeah. for, for 54 years, Tamil schools have been asking. Now we have 500 schools, 370 schools, which are not on land, which belongs to them. We've been asking. Five acres for these schools. 
1,500 or 2,000 acres. Right? And here, so easily they are helping themselves you know, to the resource of the nation. So easily. And denying, I say, the minorities of what is rightfully theirs. Right? So, Official Secrets Act kept much of, much of this story opaque until it came out as it did. Right? Otherwise we wouldn't hear about it as we are not hearing about all the rest of the other stuff that's going on. Okay? The media will spin it as an opposition ploy for the elections coming up. Right? And that's the role of the media. See how, how all of this comes together in our infrastructure of control. The MACC and the Attorney General will in all likelihood not find anything wrong with Sarita Agarwal, she told me that. Why? She didn't have anything to do with the project. No. Yeah, that's how it works. That's how it really works. Okay, so in summary, institutionalized racism is a distinct feature of Malaysian life. Institutionalized racism has evolved to become an infrastructure for the usurpation of the natural resource. Institutionalized racism has marginalized a significant section of its people. Okay? So that's my case. Now, what have we been doing? Locally, in, this is only what we did last year, representative actions on the ground taking up human you know, rights violation issues. Basically, if you institutionalize racism on one side of the coin, violation of minority rights is the other side of the coin. So we take that up. Okay? Uh, Sageless Indians. We say there are close to 400,000 Indians in the country without proper state identification documents. They are stateless. Right? But the government is in denial. And then they had this MyDafta program. And after the MyDafta program, recently there was a uh, statement in the papers saying that, you know, uh, there's still some more. So what's all this? Right? So we, we take that up. Okay, this is part of See, when we say racism, denying statehood is an aspect of racism because it is selective denials. Dilapidated Tamil schools, I keep saying that. Here, just as an example, here, that's the cabin in which the school resides. In 2004 election, they went and said, we want to build you all the school. 2008 election, they went and said, we want to build you the school. 2012 election, they have gone and said, we will build you the school. I let you decide, I let you find out if they go to school. Okay. Temple demolitions, this is, uh, you know, ongoing. And uh, now, you know, uh, without proper understanding of religious practices, you know, now there's a new argument, hey, these are not temples, these are shrines. Understanding minorities, life norms, in the, the absence of an understanding of minority life norm is another aspect of this institutional racism. Because it becomes easy to just explain something off, besides you have the media and then you have your mandos to do the rest of the work for you. So let me say a few things about that. Okay, it is not that we, uh, we were offended by the use of the word paraya, of course we were, but that was not our issue. Our issue is that you need stereotype you need to stereotype the poor, the weak, so that they can remain there. This is always the case. You look anywhere in the world, the black, the nigger, the paria. So they need that. Our, 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 uh, uh, um, what do you say, our consternation at this whole thing was that there was just no appreciation at the time of decision it's not just a question of a few words, Dr. Joa Soilek says, just take those offending words out and it should be okay. Anwar Ibrahim says, I don't find anything offending about the book. Of course, you know, I mean, when you don't see these things happening, it becomes the norm. Of course, you don't see the offense in whatever is happening. Right? So we said, no, this is not right. And we went out on the streets, right? For which 54 people are still attending court on our side. Okay, so that's some of the visuals, right? Some of the visuals from there. And then we had a, a conference of uh, minorities and marginalized communities uh, uh, last year, January sometime, and we invited all of these people. We are building relationships with these groups, and uh, we are planning another one in Sarawak sometime again this year, and we will continue, we will continue. 
Okay, so don't do that as we go from there. Okay. International initiatives. This is what Mr. Vedamurti has been doing uh, from London. He has been making this is only what he been doing, what he did in the year 2011. He's been making representations to the UN, the European governments uh, of the human rights violation of the indigenous and uh, Indian Malaysians. Okay, let me just go on. Okay, uh, this is his visit in Geneva with the group from Sabah and Sarawak. Right, basically, they made, uh, actually the RNC were invited to, but they couldn't uh, join the group. They made a uh, representation in, uh, to the Human Rights Commission in Geneva, uh, to the uh, Belgian Parliament, right? same group. They went to Holland, but I don't have the visuals from Holland. Uh, so that was in Europe, making representations uh, on behalf of the three groups. Then uh, this was his exploratory visit. Uh, before the visit, they even made the presentation for this paper uh, in uh, several cities. Exploratory visit. Then, uh, you know, some lectures. And then he's made a briefing to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission on the 10th of November last year. And the State Department to the officers in charge from Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and so on, to the senior officers there. And then briefing at the House of Representatives. And it raised many eyebrows. Indeed, is this happening? Okay, so the next step is a hearing, and uh, we don't expect it to happen in the coming year because it's an election year in the United States, it probably will happen next year. This is to raise awareness in the international community about what's going on in the country. Everybody is thinking, you know, Malaysia is truly Asia, right? And we are saying Malaysia is more than that. Come and see. We have to correct it. But it is our opinion that we cannot correct it only from within. We will need the international community to put the pressure so that political will, will develop. Okay. Then, uh, you know, the whole thing, 2007, Indra Rally was about the case which lapsed a little after that. We are reviving the case and it's going to be filed again this year. Work is underway in preparing for the case. Uh, I think some of you probably know two lawyers attempted to come into the country, part of our legal team, who will be uh, arguing the case in the United States, United Kingdom. Uh, one of the lawyers, Imran Khan, was denied entry, and the only and he, he the reason they gave him was he's a prohibited immigrant. Okay? I don't know what that means, but that's what they told him. He couldn't go in because he's a prohibited immigrant. And he went back from the airport, we just shook his hands and we left. Suresh Grover is the other. Okay? And Suresh Grover came with us, we took him around the country. This is part of the preliminary work that we're doing, fact-finding mission. Okay? And our ultimate aim is for the UK government to accept initial responsibility. I say initial because there's subsequent responsibility also. Initial responsibility for the misery and margin marginalization for the Indian poor in Malaysia. What we are finding now through our research in preparing for the case is that there is a case for all Malaysians, not just Indians. That's what we are finding. In all the correspondences that we've got evidence for right now, all the pollution that has gone on between the British colonial government and the aristocracy of the day, the pollution that's gone on. So we, we are now uh, looking to the possibility of expanding this just from an Indian case into a Malaysian case. Yeah. And uh, next year, when the case is filed and goes to court, many untold truths will come out, and it probably will change some of the discourse, some of the narrative in the country. Okay. So that's what we've been doing about this up to now. So what next? Now, some caveat. It's our belief that none of the political parties, not even the opposition, have the necessary political will to eliminate this deeply entrenched racism. It is our belief. There is a real and there is a real mafia out there holding the reins. A real mafia. You know, mafia is uh, you know uh, underworld uh, social system where those who are involved within the ma mafia just do what they are told. And for those who are outside, 
you know, and uh, you know, the, uh, in the community that the mafia operates in, you better do what you are told, right? So that's the kind of situation we have, right? Now, that's not an easy, as, as what you know, Dr. Lim and uh, you know, I'm sure all the other speakers would say, it's not going to be easy to change the state of affairs, right? We believe the political parties will not be able. To, political parties will will be led by the people. The people have to be. People have to understand that this, this, what we have in our country, institutional racism, has to go. And civil society has to power that movement to eliminate this scourge. Okay? And international pressure to supplement. We need a sustained and high profile campaign locally to educate, which we are now working on. Need this type of forum, this type of forum to be held throughout the country. Need to collaborate more widely within civil society to educate and promote new social values. Need to expand participation in this campaign uh, to end uh, to end institution. Okay, to end institution. Okay. Okay. On this uh, uh, item of uh, you know uh, international campaign, we invite individuals and NGOs to join us in this campaign. We can organize joint briefings okay, in the international community. We have done that, we have the capability to do that, the capacity to do that, we are doing that. We are pushing for a hearing in the US Senate and US House of Representatives and you can volunteer to provide testimony or provide evidence at these hearings. We invite individuals and organizations who want to work with us in that way. Provide funding to extend campaign to other countries to inter really internationalize. See, because only when Malaysia starts to smell like apartheid will there be any political will really to change. Or you can join us in the class action suit against the UK government. This will make the suit even more significant. How to do that? If there's any interest, you know, contact us. Whether we win or lose the suit, the case of institutionalized racism within Malaysia will be up for everybody to see. We would have won. What we have today, 2012, is a result of the dynamics of the last half century. If you do not change these dynamics, think, what is the next half century going to be like? And the longer we wait, the longer it's going to take. Okay? And our agenda is not personal. We look forward to working with all parties who can see synergistic historical opportunity. And as I said, slavery was morally wrong. It had to go, it went. Colonialism was morally wrong. It had to go, it went. I put it to you. Racism is morally wrong, it has to go. We have to make it go. Thank you very much. Passionate, very powerful, and uh, in many ways a very insightful presentation. Um, my only um, uh, comment uh, right now is that um, his, his uh, statement that the non Malays did not benefit at all from the uh, economic pie after independence is not correct. Uh, institutional racism is all that more difficult to address in Malaysia to eradicate because the economic fruits were also taken up by the non-Malay elite who were co-opted, who colluded, and who collaborated in this system that was set up. In fact, a large share of the economic pie and benefits went to these cronies and collaborators, including in the MIC and in the Indian community, and amongst Indian professionals. Ananda so, Krishnan. You know, let's, let's not forget about that. Huh? Second but, richest man in Malaysia. Yeah. But as I said, you know, generally the trust of that uh, presentation uh, is, is, is extremely uh, powerful and, to my mind, uh, very valid. I'm going to pass you on to the next uh, speaker without delay.
Uh, this is Dr. Kwa Kiasu. Thank you, Dr. Lim, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Asmi and uh, Anissa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be sharing the same panel as uh, Indra, uh, which I think has been the most uh, progressive in this whole movement uh, against institutional racism. I hope that this is the beginning of a, a continuing movement based on solidarity because sometimes I find that uh, when, I, when I serve the web, I'm also being attacked by Eugene Ra. Uh, so I, I hope uh, you know, this is the beginning of a, 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 a love affair. But I'll try and put a different spin on uh, what Gavisan has said. Because honestly, this We've been, this country has been going for 54 years, as you know, and uh, the Arunoku Trust has been get, going, getting away with murder for so long. I remember when I was a 20 year old, 20 odd year old student, uh, my PhD thesis was on class and communalism in Malaysia. My first book was on class and communalism in Malaysia, published by Z Press, and my thesis in this book is no different from what it is today. It's the same today, but things seem to be getting worse. Along the line, different minorities have picked up different momentum. Today, it is hate drop. I remember in the mid-80s, the Chinese assembly hall here, and with the rest of the Chinese associ associations, was also very active in the Civil Rights Committee in the 80s. So this is how history has moved. But let's, let's review it a bit. Uh, for a working definition, institutional racism is what Stephen Anden, who is the director of the Institute of Race Relations in, in, in the United Kingdom and the publisher of the well-known journal called Race and Class. He says, institutional racism is that which covertly or overtly resides in the policies, procedures, operations, and culture of public or private institutions, reinforcing individual prejudices and being enforced by them in turn. And we see that in almost all the institutions uh, in, the, uh, in, in Malaysia. Uh, Ghanizan has already talked about how the British are responsible, and in my, in my recent books on uh, patriots and pretenders, uh, I try to show how the British colonial power reneged on their promises after the post after the, uh, the Second World War. Because after the Second World War, it was a time when civil liberties was a cry all over the world. And so the Malay Union, although it did not give self rule to Malay at the time, did promise civil liberties civil equality, okay, but because the British also rocked up the fairness of the Malay rulers at the time, they revolted against the Malay Union. But so did also the rest of the Malay people, united under the pan Malay Council of Joint Action and Putra, made of the Malay National Party and, 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 and etc. And so, after the revolt by the Malay rulers, as Afghanistan said earlier on about the Malay aristocracy, the British reneged on their promises, negotiated with the Malay, Malay rulers and Amno behind the backs of everybody else in Malaya. And that's how it came up with the Federation of Malaya Proposals in 1948, in which the requirements for citizenship, etc., were very, very stringent, ridiculously stringent for the time of the world. And so what we have at independence was Article 153. Article 153, as you know, was a clause allowing affirmative action, but it was, it was a clause that was borrowed from the Indian Constitution, where affirmative action was for the Harijans, who were a less privileged minority in India. In this country, the Malays were certainly not a minority, 
they want a majority as well as the community that was holding the political power in this country that dominated civil service. Okay, this is the difference, difference between affirmative action in the federal constitution of Malaya and the affirmative action in India. And so, with the British colonial power reneging on their promises, they came up, the, the recommission in the end came up with a kind of sunset clause. I think it was 15 years at the time. But when people, uh, when Malayans were independent, they expected that that sunset clause would at least, at the very longest, uh, you know, be 15 years, or at the most, 1990. I think when the new economic policy was, uh, was uh, implemented in 1971, people expected the new economic policy to end in 1990, which it hasn't. And I want people to just scrutinize Article 153. It's the number two clause of Article 153 says, to ensure the reservation for Malays and natives of any other states of Sabah and Sarawak, and that only came in in 1971, Sabah and Sarawak, you know, that, 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 that amendment, or such proportion as he may deem reasonable of positions in the public service and of scholarships, permits, licenses, etc. And as Gannison has, has already mentioned, it excludes the Oran Nasi, who are the original people of this country. And the third clause in, in Article 153 is that the Yemi Batuan Agong may, in accordance with Clause 2, give such general directions to any commission. <coughs> the phraseology of, uh, of Article 153, and I'm sure our, our lawyer, Dr. Asmi, will give us some, some guidance on this. Uh, you will see that the way in which this affirmative action clause is phrased in Article 153 means that it has to be carried out with certain caution, with certain directions from the Yangi Patuan Agong before any kind of uh, affirmative action is carried out in any part of the Malaysian economy or, or institutions. But then, May 13 happened, as one of my, 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 my book uh, said that to me it was an orchestrated uh, coup d'etat. But this thesis is not. Uh, I'm not the, uh, the author of this thesis. Earlier on, uh, there's uh, an academic from PASS called Sufi Latif, who at an academic conference in, uh, in Singapore, in the Institute of Civilization Studies, had already come up with this thesis before me to say that in May 13, 1969, was a coup d'etat in the Tunku, which was, according in my analysis, the emergent state capitalists in AMNO, in the state bureaucracy at the time, to overthrow the Malay aristocracy led by Tunku, because they were greedy for, for, uh, for having that, that, uh, that, capital, that state capital in the, in, the, in the economy, and that was one way to get rid of the Tunku. And uh, of course it worked. And after May 13, Malay centrism, Bumiputraism became that central ideology. I mean, it's a very good ideology to use, a very good populist ideology to use. You know, telling the Malays this is your land against the Pandata, you know, and, and, and using it for them to uh, accumulate uh, more and more riches under the, the NEP. And bear in mind that the 1971 amendment to Article 153 happened during a state of emergency after May 13, you know, as you know, uh, the state of emergency, only now, after how many years, uh, the government is talking about abrogating the state of emergency. But the 1971 amendment to the Article 153 was handled under the state of emergency. And that is the amendment that gave rise to the, to the, the so-called quota system that has made hell for all Malaysians up to now. There is a lot uninhibited discrimination, okay? And again, if you look at 8A, you look at Amendment to 19, Article 153 8A, where in any university, college, or other educational institution, the number of places is less than the number of candidates qualified for such places, it shall be lawful for the young people to one other to give such directions to the authority 
as may be required to ensure the reservation of such proportional such places for Malays and natives of any of the states. Again, you see that the, that kind of non-committed action is, again, not uninhibited. If you find that in a faculty of law, for example, the MU, there is a need to have a bigger proportion for Malays, okay? That faculty can apply, to, can ask the, the Agong to uh, allow such a quota for Malays. Well, reading that, I'm not sure if that any, any other lawyer or, or law professor uh, read that into that, but I, this was the interpretation of uh, the dean of the, the law faculty of Singapore, called Sina Durai, writing in the, the book called the, the uh, the Constitution of Malaysia with with uh, with the Trinidad and Sufia, and this is his interpretation. That as far as he knows, this was not followed. This at that time was not even gazetted, and he has no idea whether what has been going on, what has been what has been carrying out with, with you know uh, without any inhibition has been done by the Ministry of Education or has been done with the direction of the Yanni Patron Album. So this is something that I think anybody apply, for example, I, I, and any of your children, my children are big now, uh, apply to UITM, for example, and if you feel you get in, challenge it in the court. And if our judiciary is as independent as everybody is saying now after the sodomy uh, uh, case, then you have a good chance that you will win, based on my reading of the uh, the Article uh, 153 Amendment 8A. So uh, I won't go into great length with the racism and the racial discrimination that has been in existence ever since, in even greater extreme after 1971. In the government the development policies, Canada, Petronas, etc. You know. Uh, business contracts <clears throat> discounts. I was quite amazed recently when uh, I think it was in the state of Selangor. They said that Bhumiputra's five million and below and above won't be entitled to discounts. You know, I mean, if, you, uh, if you can afford a 2.5 million house, do you need a discount? <laughs> if you can't get afford a one million house, do you need a discount? If you can afford a 500,000 house, do you need a discount? You know? That, that's that's, that's the energy. And in, 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 the, in the last 10, 50 years, shares allocation, uh, AP, etc., during the time uh, when Anwar was, uh, you know, the, the kind of TKTB after Razali, TKTB, uh, uh, you know, every day in the new, in the new, new street science, we had this uh, Mahate group. Publishing who had gained from the shares allocation, etc. This is all the carry on because of that rivalry with the unknown. <clears throat> Cultural policy in the 1980s, the Chinese W. Hollier was one of the, the, the leaders in that. When I remember when Ryan Bundy Chi was trying to level Bukit China. You know, today we discovered that Han Tua and Han Li Po and everybody else never existed. <laughs> but uh, Bukit China was. Is the hill where the Chinese who have been here for hundreds of years, uh, Mr. Sim was in detention with me and was one of the leaders in this Chinese army hall. It's got, it's got a, uh, an ancestry that goes up to 800 years. 800 years. Some of these people are buried at Bukit China. And because of the national cultural policy, they were going to level Bukit China and use the soil for reclamation in the Malacca Straits. Katonan Malayu today is used, you know, even the apologists of Katonan Malayu, of all people, uh, Dr. Chandra Buzafa, has now said that Katonan Malayu is not the Malay dominance. It is not defined as Malay dominance, it is defined as Malay sovereignty. And Malay sovereignty means the sovereignty of the Malay Sultanate. This is the most incredible. Uh, Rehabilitation of the concept I've ever heard. <coughs> but of all people, you know, because for, for the last decade since Abdullah Ahmad uh, came up with his infamous speech in, in Singapore in 1986, and Kedas, my good friend Kedas, who passed away in the early 90s, published a whole book called the, 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 the Dola Rubric. 
you know, where he <coughs> compiled all the criticisms of Dola uh, Ahmad's thesis on on Katwana uh, Malayu. Uh, <coughs> privatization and Amnapushra, we are too familiar with that. Education policy. Remember in 2004 when the, uh, the former higher education minister Shafi'i Saleh, he had just lost, by the way, he had just lost the UMNO elections. So the UMNO General Assembly was playing a great hero. He said as long as he was the higher education minister, he would not allow a single non Putra to enter EYTM. Not a single non Putra to enter EYTM. Is that discrimination? <laughs> is that discrimination? Not one. You know how big UITM is? We've got so many campuses from Malaysia, and the enrollment in any particular time in Malaysia is more than 100,000. And they will not allow a single non Putra to enter the institute, which is a public sector institution, which is provided for by all Malaysian taxpayers, but he will not allow a single non Putra to enter UITM. Of course, there were great cheers in uh, the Arnold General Assembly. And <clears throat> uh, Roman scholarships, I think that Dyson has done that. Chinese and Tamil schools. After 54 years, the number of Chinese and Tamil schools is now minus 70 for Chinese schools and minus 200 for Tamil schools. Our population has doubled since 1957. But the schools have got a negative number, you know. And recently, the, 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 the enrollment in schools have, have gone up. Uh, recently, I just want to see my children's school near, near the new village near my... It doesn't have a name, it's called the Batu Sibilan Chiras Primary School. And they had a... <clears throat> the land, total land area in, the, in their schools is less than one acre. And in the time when they went to school in the 80s, there are 2,000 students in less than one acre. And recently, you know, typical Chinese uh, educationists. They keep building up. <clears throat> and at that time, my children had one basketball court. Now there's no basketball court anymore. There's the whole one acre just full of five, eight, five story building. I just wondered how they move from one building to another. There's just passageway. And that is, that is, that is what's happening in the Chinese temple schools. <clears throat> at the same time, there, is, there are more than 60,000 non-Chinese in Chinese primary schools now. And one school can be as few as 100 students. Like the Chinese primary school in, in Fraser's Hill. It's got two classrooms made of Indians. So 100, if, you have, if one school is made of 100 students, 60,000 Students divided by 100 is how many, how many students? Is how many schools? And that's the, the number of schools we have got left in this country. Discrimination in the civil armed services. <clears throat> Recently, the, I think the Ministry of Defense said that the, the Chinese are unpatriotic because they don't want to join the army. I remember when I was in school, it was very glamorous for our, <clears throat> our classmates to join the army. And my brother, my brother was. Uh, was an aunt, was, a, was a doctor, and instead of serving in the public hospitals, he chose to serve in the army, an army captain. Some of my, the, 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 the top sprinters in my school, the Chinese, they, they, they wanted to join the, the, the army. And at the time of May 13, I always pointed out, the Federal Reserve Unit was mainly made up of Chinese bad hats. The police wanted them to deal with the gangsters. So the Federal Reserve Unit at the time was mainly Chinese. So it's not true that the Chinese do not want to be army uh, soldiers or policemen. And the proportion of the Chinese in the RMA in 1960 was 40%. Proportion of Chinese in the civil service in 1960 was 30%. There are no... There are no... Uh, Chinese vice chancellors today in any of the public sector universities it's because the Chinese don't like universities. You know? And the same goes. The more devious, the more uh, 
devious form of, of institutional racism, I think it's still the racist indoctrination that goes on in all the, the, the public institutions. Uh, we saw it in all the Arnold General Assembly, and any sociologist in the public university has a good idea to go through all the previous, of the last 10, 20 years, General Assembly, and have a good uh, read of everything that was said in this General Assembly. Because I think people only took note just before the 2008 uh, elections, when one of the last General Assemblies was televised live to the great shock of everybody of what was said at the General Assembly. But actually the same, those kinds of related racism was said in all so many other General Assemblies before that. Uh, BTM and me as an entertainee, I know about BTM because they tried to do Dr. Munehan with us, rehabilitation. The first, the first thing you go to, uh, you're sent by police coach to Gamutin detention camp is to see the camp that says, not the detention camp, it says camp Gamutin for Munehan. I remember that we all got there and said, who wanted to rehabilitate? You know. And then you have school assemblies in, for, for detainees. Your school children have school assemblies once a week. But we, including uh, the leader of the opposition, including Kapal Singh, including uh, Mr. Simo, who was 70 over years old, including me, etc., we were supposed to have three assemblies every week. And we were supposed to pledge loyalty to the government. Why do you have to pledge loyalty to the government? The leader of the opposition comes from a different government, from a different party from the government. Why does it pledge loyalty to the government? And because of that, <clears throat> you know, we played that, uh, the, read the newspapers at that time. They said, these guys are really anti national because they refuse to sing the national anthem, because they refuse to take part in the assembly three times a week. You don't take part in the assembly three times a week, it shows you're anti national because you don't want to sing the national anthem three times a week. How many times do we have to sing the national anthem? Any of you? Okay? I think my point is <clears throat> proven. Um, the point that was already been made by Hindra about the death in custody. Uh, I come from Swaram and we'll be monitoring death in custody and uh, death by police shootings. And there is a frighteningly high proportion of Indians who are killed. Dead who are killed in, in police custody and who are killed in police shootings. And this is where uh, the statistics are there for you to see, okay? And, uh, and there's really a very serious... It, 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 I have not been part of the, the, the academic fraternity in this country, because I was a sociologist in this country. I'd be very interested to, to do sociological studies of this phenomenon. How is it that, that Indians are supposed to be a minority in this country, less than 10%, percent? less than 10%. They outnumber everybody else in terms of uh, death in custody. You know? So the racism in this country has got, uh, you know, in the sociology we, we have all kinds of concepts and, 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 and nice terms to describe all this, uh, this phenomenon. But it is certainly a, a sociological interest to find the difference in the kind of racism. And of course it has come about only because through the years, the Indians in this country have become the marginalized community. Uh, the estates have been uh, progressively destroyed and the leadership in the Indian community has been lacking until he dropped him off. Uh, and that is accounted for the racism by the police and the racism that, that how it works, you have to work behind the scenes. Sociologists have got to go behind the scenes to see how they think. How do the police think? You know, how do the, the, uh, the people in authority think uh, to allow that to happen? It's a good in sociological study. Uh, and of course the most alarming of all is the fascism of the far right. That is the, that is the, uh, the limit. There is a limit of racism. Okay, because fascism as we saw with the Nazis and the fascists of Italy and the fascists of, of Japan during the Second World War. That's the, that's the ultimate. We've seen the far right in, in many of the, of, the, of the European countries as well, and uh, in the United States, like the Ku Klux Klan, that is the far right uh, fascism. And the most 
The most serious case, of course, uh, since independence was 69 May 13, which I've written about in the book. And uh, I said also in the book that we need a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission to really uh, wash away the, the kind, of, the kind of collective conscience of that period. The 1987 Amno rally in Tamil Nadu, the Jalan Raja Muda Stadium, where the present Prime Minister was on stage, uh, uh, being a big hero as well, and they're calling for Chinese blood. That is a very serious. That's a very serious. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if there if there was a, an equality and human rights commission, and the police were impartial, most of them should be locked up. Would have been locked up, okay? Uh, the 1999 Amno uh, Youth demo against here, threatening the mob to burn down the Chinese Army Hall. The Suchu election demands that the Barisan National, including Mahate, had agreed to before the 99 general elections. But after that, Amno Youth comes to have a rally here asking them to, re to withdraw the Suchu demands. It is the, the idiotic. Uh, Irony of the whole thing. Uh, and then the Malay Action Front, you know, I think, uh, as we said, they have been, that, that, that fascism has been outsourced to, uh, to Parkasa and Pakita. And the, uh, the most serious in recent years has been the 2001 Kapo Medan murders. I call them murders because they were firing into the Kapo Medan uh, murders. You know, there is a tendency for people to say, Oh, that is already 10 years. It's too long. 10 years is not long. 1987 is not long. 1969 is not long. The blacks, I remember last year, was the 200th anniversary of black slavery. And the blacks in Africa were calling for compensation from the, from the colonial powers 200 years ago. We, we were calling for the compensation against the, uh, the killing of the Batan Kani people in 1948. Is that a long time ago? Anyone is not a long time ago. You know, so, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> but I hope, like uh, Hindra has, has said, what is to be done? <coughs> Where and from now? You know? And you know, at the moment, Swaram and other NGOs are busy trying to have the 13th general election demands. It's time we make some demands on the political parties. Uh, and one of them is to abolish the new economic policy <coughs> that came in after May 13 in 1971. Okay? So it has nothing to do with the uh, new economic policy, it has nothing to do with the uh, so called so social contract in 1957. We should have means testing, like I said. Does the 2.5 million house require discount? No, you have, you have a certain means. Your income is at a certain level. You're not entitled to any affirmative action. That's a simple fact of life in every country, in, uh, in the States, in the United Kingdom as well. We should have an Equality Act. Recently, the government has said that they want a race relations act. But I'm, I'm reading their mind. And the Race Relations Act is actually to deal with people like us. <laughs> it's not to deal with the people who are shouting for blood in 1987. You know, that is what they want to know. It's like they say, oh, we're going to solve the question of uh, peaceful assembly and then they come up with a peaceful assembly bill, which is worse than any of our other, other bills. And this is what they're going to do with the Anti-Terrorism Act in place of the ISA, the Race Relations Act that will play the role of the Sedition Act, etc. But we want an Equality Act that can take into account all cases of institutional racism. And not only that, that also takes account of gender, age, disability, etc. And there should be equality and that the Higher Human Rights Commission, the Suhakam, should really embody an equality uh, portion in the, in the Commission. They should now, from now on, embrace an equality uh, part of, of the Commission besides human rights when the Equality Act has been passed. Uh, there should be merit-based recruitment. I think at the moment, 
With the civil service and the armed services being, I think the armed service is something like more than 95% would be bushra. And the civil service is more than 77% would be bushra. It is not unreasonable to say that from now on, there should be a merit-based uh, recruitment in the civil and armed services. And lastly, we should ratify the convention for the elimination of race discrimination to make sure that international uh, policies on, on race discrimination are implemented in the state, in the, in the national laws and in the state laws. And the international covenant on civil and political rights that ensures equality for all will also be uh, embodied. Okay, so I stop here, thank you. Of the uh, system of institutionalized racism. You know, I want to jog your memory a little bit because one of the two prongs of the NEP was for um, redressing of the uh, occupational imbalance. And that related not only to the uh, private sector, where the Malays were underrepresented, but it also related to the uh, uh, redressal of the overrepresentation of Malays at that time in the public sector. Now, that prong of the NEP was never honoured. And it was not only not honoured, but it was in fact made worse. And the blame for that falls on the MIC, which resulted in... <laughs> I'm just uh, making the point a little bit. Which, which allowed the uh, railway department, which allowed the PWB D to be uh, decimated of its uh, Indian labor force. It, the blame must be put on the NCA and the Karakan for failing to uh, push the equitable uh, redressal of uh, occupations and also on the uh, East Malaysian party. So, you know, I think uh, we got to uh, look at ourselves very, very clearly in the mirror and uh, analyze uh, what are the main springs of this uh, institutional racism and who are the main uh, state players and actors? You'll have a chance to respond later. Now, uh, before I uh, give the floor to the uh, last uh, speaker, let me just say something about Azmi. I want to pay tribute to his being here. You know, it's uh, in a sense uh, stepping into the den of lions, okay? <laughs> I had Malay friends, academics, professors in my time who would never, ever come to this kind of a forum. Uh, and I think that when Asmi writes about a great new world, he's not only a writer, he's also an actor. He's a state player. And uh, I want to pay tribute to his... Uh, his uh, idealism as well as his uh, courage and his, his, of course he's going to contribute also his intellectual uh, substance to us this evening. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's just over the top. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I like it. Well, you know, who wouldn't? <laughs> I uh, hope you don't mind if I sit down. It's quite a low hall. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Is that right? Because, you know, it's getting late and um, this is not nearly strong enough. <laughs> <laughs> you should learn, you know, how to properly get the right drinks. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That will that'll be great. Um, well, I, I want to um, thank um, my two um, esteemed panelists for saying everything that I wanted to say. <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll just, what I'll do is I'll just um, add little bits and bobs um, where, where I think um, requires it. Uh, both my fellow panelists both uh, mentioned Article 153, and this is like a, a very important um, aspect of it. Because if you're talking about institutionalized racism, and by the way, I won't be brief, I won't be long. Um, our institutions are all based on the Constitution. So what's in the Constitution becomes of vital importance. 
because it colors what our institutions um, are. Yeah. So we have to deal with the constitution. And I'm glad um, that it's been raised because it is absolutely um, vital and, and important. And um, see, what, what, what people forget about Article 153 is that it has to be read in line with Article 8. And Article 8 says that we are all equal. It's, it's quite clear. We are all equal. Right? Article 8 also says there will be times when we are not all equal. But any act of inequality has to be specifically allowed for in the Constitution. It cannot be anything that you want. So, you know, a 10% discount for Kari Jalaluddin's house cannot. Because it's not in the Constitution. It's not allowed in the Constitution. So it's actually salah, wrong. Right? So, you know, there, there are other things which are unequal in the Constitution. Some of it is like, nobody's going to get cut much of a fuss. For example, it says that in, in certain institutions, uh, your religion will matter. So, if you want to be a Sharia judge, you'll have to be a Muslim. Who on earth will want to be a Sharia judge? I don't know, but if you want to be a Sharia judge, you have, you, 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 you have to be a Muslim. Right? You know, and no one's, not, no one's going to get too much of a fuss about those kinds of things. What we're, what we're talking about here is, uh, you know, our education, our lives, you know, our day to day lives. Right? And, and in, in the Constitution, it's clear you can only do things which are unequal if the Constitution allows for it. So, what does 153 allow for? It's quite limited. You just have to read the Constitution. I, I won't bore you with it, but basically, it's uh, quotas with education and scholarship, uh, but two licenses for trade, and um, government service, quotas in government service. So it's actually, it's, it's very narrow, the kinds of uh, things you can do which are unequal. And on top of that, I mean, uh, Kiasu mentioned this, yeah? there's an element of reasonableness. Okay? So that means any ac action which is done, uh, which is so-called authoritative action under 153, has got to be reasonable. Now, if you say something is reasonable or not, that means it can be questioned. Right? So if, if you do something which is unreasonable, then it's unconstitutional. But then how do you know whether it's unreasonable or not? It has to be questioned. It has to be challenged. And it has to be decided for decided in court. That's the proper way. Okay? But how do these ayams uh, interpret 153 is? <laughs> you cannot question anything about 153. Okay, even if we take that statement as correct, okay, fine, all right, okay. Solution act, <laughs> all right. Risk relations act, whatever you want to call it. All right? Even if we can't question 153, surely we can question the implementation of 153 because the 153 has to be implemented properly. It has to be constitutional. But that's not how these people think because they don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot think. <laughs> Oh, by the way, uh, Agung, he doesn't actually have any real power in this experiment. All this stuff, that, you know, when he says Agung does this, Agung does that, it's, a it's under advice. The Agung only has two real powers. One is to appoint a prime minister, and the other one is to uh, dissolve parliament. Or not to dissolve parliament if he chooses not to. That's the only two powers he has. So everything else is, is not the Agung. I personally think we should just leave the Agung alone. <laughs> Alright, okay, uh, so that's that. And, and, you know, and, and there are other things in the Constitution, for example, there's Article 136, which says that no one in the federal service can be discriminated against. So all these things about the civil service, I don't know why non Malays don't join the civil service, it's because they're not going to get promoted. Alright, I mean, or, you know, uh, the... Uh, university vice chancellor, you know, it's not jazz normally. There's people like me also who will never be vice chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but actually, the constitution says you cannot be discriminated against in the service. But no one talks about that. No one talks about that. You know, Ibrahim Ali, in all his rotundness, <laughs> says he's a defender of the constitution. Yeah, defend 136. Why don't you? <laughs> right? Of course you won't. So these are certain things. So basically, yeah, 
For me, the, the problem, yes, the Constitution allows for certain things, and, and the, the trouble is it's been totally and utterly uh, abused. And why is that? Because I think we've lost any sense of aspiration. This country has lost any sense of philosophy. This country has lost any sense of idealism. We've become so pragmatic. So what, what, we, what they've been doing is they've been taking these uh, provisions and they're not making decisions based on any sort of overarching idea of equality. They're making decisions based purely on greed and pragmatism. And let's be frank, uh, we are all equally guilty because how the hell else is by some national being in power all this time because we've been pragmatic. All of us have been pragmatic. Support, we scared. We're all equally to blame. I'm sorry, the whole bloody country. I've never voted for them, incidentally, buddy. <laughs> so, if we're talking about institutionalized racism, yes, um, you know, all the, everything else, you know, all, all the issues have been, have been talked about. Um, schools, I just want to make a special mention here in, about schools. It's not just about uh, the, the, the facilities and the, the lack of uh, facilities for, for certain types of schools. If you look at the syllabus as well now, uh, he and I have been working on this. Uh, the history syllabus, for example. The tone of the history syllabus is racist. It's totally racist. It talks about Kaun Pandatang. You know, it's perpetually pushing this idea, right, that some people belong here and some people actually are lucky to be allowed to be here. It pushes that. And this is what's being taught to our children. Right? And, and on top of that, all the Malaysian textbooks now have one Malaysian on it. Malaysia cannot be known. Double propaganda in schools. There you go. And then, um, but you know, okay, look. No, at, at the end of it all, ultimately, it boils down to a certain extent. To, it's just uh, our attitude also. I mean, look at our politics. Huh? Just, okay, forget about the fact that the political parties are racially based. Okay? We, we, we talk about uh, in elections, huh? Oh, this is a Malay area. This is a Chinese area. This area has a large number of Indians. You're making political decisions based, election decisions based on race. Not about issues anymore, you know. It's race. So who do we put up here? Someone who will be uh, acceptable to, to, the, to, the, to the people in that area. I know. That's, that's how, how, how low we have sunk. And, you know, I mean, uh, I mean they, they mentioned about you know, me coming here. Actually, you know, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. I, I have been known as Pontianak Melayu for a long time already. Um, but, you see, that's the thing. You see, you, you know, you, you, you it's, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, I mean, like, for example, you know, if, if I say things like what, what I'm saying now, all right, and, and uh, whoever, you know, will say, oh, ask me, Pontiana Melayu, all right? I mean, people will say, hey, how are don't say things like that? You know, that's not, that's not good, you know? But then, you know, and, and usually it's, it's not Malays like, who say, you know, hey, don't say like that, it's, it's not nice, you know? He's just making a point, don't talk like that. And then someone like uh, Ku Ke Kim says something, against Chinese school, for example, and Chinese people say, hey, from China, China. <laughs> My point is that, huh? it's deep inside us, you know? It's not just about the law, it's not just about the institutions, it's also about us as a people. That knee-jerk reaction. And that's the, that's the toughest thing to get rid of, which brings me to my next point. What do we do? Race Relations Act, hold up, forget it. It's rubbish. I can guarantee you now, how can you have a system with a constitution like ours and say that you want to have a Race Relations Act? You cannot. It, it, you cannot balance the two. You, you cannot. Yeah, and on top of that, I can guarantee you, yes, you're right, it will be used against us. It won't be used against Ibrahim Ali, it won't be used against those kinds of idiots. It will be used against people like us, who are not idiots. <laughs> what to do? Judicial progressiveness? You know, you know, if we challenge these things, 
for example, uh, the UITM issue, for example, or if a, a government civil servant feels that he's being discriminated against and he challenges it under Article 136, can he get the judiciary, perhaps, right, to make the right kinds of decisions? I don't know. Frankly, I think the judiciary needs many, many years before I can feel any sort of confidence. Uh, in, in, in not just that, in, not just in the independence, but intelligence. <laughs> you know, so you know, it's. I'm not quite sure whether we can depend on judicial activism, right? Um, change the constitution, change it completely. Oh, I, 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 I think pragmatically, pragmatic, and I'm sorry for being pragmatic. <laughs> but there are some battles which may not best be fought at the moment. However, having said that. Even if we change the constitution, if we do not have a paradigm shift in our thinking, it's not going to make much use. There has to be a paradigm shift in the way Malaysians think about ourselves. And that's the key, that's the problem. Now, I believe, right, I, 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 I still have a vague belief in the political system. Right? And I believe that right now, we don't really have any strong leadership to say no to racism. I mean, think about it. Which American president was the one who started the ball rolling with regards to racial equality? It wasn't, you know, it's, it's, it's what is it, the guy after Roosevelt. Uh, come on, any historians here? Truman. Was it Truman? He was Roosevelt's deputy, right? Yeah. And then, Truman was from the South. This was what? The 40s, the 50s? You know, this was the time when lynching happened. And you've got a man who came from the Deep South, who grew up with the idea of slaves and niggers and all the rest of it, and he was the one who said, look, we've got to make the necessary legislative changes to make this a thing of the past. That means leadership can count. Leadership can count. Yes, we can be cynical about leadership, but leadership can count. So for me, I'm going to ask my whoever's standing uh, for, for, for parliament in, in BJSL, are we all equal? Are we all equal? And if the butter cannot look me in the eye and say, yes, we are all equal, I'm going to say, you go to hell. I'm not going to vote for you. Right? So. We, we, we've got to push it, we've got to make this an agenda. And hopefully in that way, um, um, something uh, can come out. But it's, 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 it's dangerous to, to, to believe only in politicians. Yeah. At the end of the day, it really is about us. We have to understand what, it's, what the issues are, we have to understand uh, what the law is, and what the law should be, what the aspirations of the law was, and should be, and we've got to push. We have got to push consistently and constantly because no one else is going to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Alni, for that uh, down to earth, clear uh, call to us uh, not to uh, put too much weight on our politicians. Um, I think. What you said makes a lot of sense. I think we've got to get Islamic scholars come out and uh, tell us what they think about institutionalized racism in this Malaysia and offer their points of view. We need your Malay intelligentsia and uh, Malay academics to hold forums like this in the universities. Maybe the uh, Academic Staff Association of University of Malaya we want to uh, <laughs> tell the cat on this and lead the way for the other universities. Now, uh, I'm going to open the floor to comments and questions and uh, just a couple of quick reminders. Number one, please uh, try to uh, base your presentation on facts and substance. Number two, uh, be respectful. And uh, number three, uh, don't overgeneralize or make long speeches, okay? I'm going to give you uh, two, three minutes or so. Uh, direct your comments uh, and questions at any one of the three uh, panelists. Uh, this was the first hand up. Hello, my name is Azira. I'm from Canada, Australia. 
this is regarding the point on Article 153. Yeah? Um, I think it was Mr. Andrew uh, Garrison, you, Dr. Kwak Chan Song, made a comment regarding on Article 153 plus 2. I'm saying where there is this term, such proportion as may be reasonable, and special position of the police, I think have not really been judicially defined yet by the Asian courts. I may be mistaken, but that's me correct. Right, right. um, so I'm asking this. In America, for the case of Brown versus Board of Education, you have uh, the story, the short story is this. It's a black, uh, an African American girl who's trying to apply for uh, a position in a all white, uh, all Caucasian school. And she succeeded in court. So judicial activism actually can still affect change to this society. My question is this, I'm from your picking your ITM. Um, I have I have seen international students, Chinese from China in the university, Koreans in the university, Mauritians in the university, Yemen students in the university. So then again, why is this not challenged in your ITM in the courts? Just asking. So yeah. Hi, Harris here. Um, I, want to, I want to just address your presentation, Alison. And it, it brought to my mind this consideration. I think we should ask ourselves who the villains are, who the villains are, and who the victims. Now, you, in your comparison with the uh, South African apartheid, in your first part, you indicated that there it was, in fact, the whole of the elite of the 18%. Then, in comparison to our situation here, it was the elite of the 67%. Now, that's immediately suggested that it's only the elite of the Malays. And I, I go back to what they said just now, that post-70, 71, when we had uh, a line put by the side and it is placed by Risa National. You have all the political parties, practically all, in Samanando. I, I, sorry, I, I don't call this Samanando anymore, Malaya. <laughs> and then the political parties in Sabah and Sarawak. So the reality is this this couldn't have been done only by AMNO without the cooperation of all the other political leaders of all the other political parties. And this is why I said we need to identify the villain. The real villain. It's not just Amno, it's Amno. Amno couldn't have done it all by itself. It needed the cooperation of all the other political party leaders. Collusion. Now that's as, as far as the, um, uh, that aspect goes. Now 153, I think we've already heard from, from Azmi. My personal view is 153, right in the context of what he said in the Reconship Report, um, is in fact no more than an affirmative action program. It was envisaged it shouldn't go for more than 15 years. We know May 13, 1969, interfered any, with any possible review. But see it as something that is potentially rather innocuous and in fact quite positive. And then identify who the, who the, the villains are again. Post-1971, it's Barisa National, Barisa National, Barisa National, not 153. Now you also mentioned that through the DEDs, billions, billions did not reach the non malay citizens. The reality is it also did not reach the poor Malays. It did not reach the poor Dayak, Iban, Magadan. Basically, the poor had been marginalized. What I say, not just the non-Malays. Now, I think the problem is this. Um, as I said, it, it has to start with us. Ten years ago, ten years ago, when I had the film forms, you always had this race, religion, sex. Race 10 years ago, I put irrelevant, irrelevant, irrelevant. <laughs> Starting from 2007, 2008, it is Anak Bangsa Malaysia. I refuse to put any, anything else. Um, religion, I put irrelevant, and sex, I put yes, please. <laughs> okay, now, uh, I think what I'm trying to say is this. It starts with us. If 28 million Malaysians, okay, forget the kids, half of us, the adults, if the adults refuse to be classified, that's the end of it. It's up to us. Um, may I propose that the forum puts forward a resolution of what we've discussed today? Okay, um, summing up from what the speakers had said, um, may I suggest the following? 
Um, one, if, if everybody in the hall agrees, you know, we should say that um, Malaysia has to first ratify the United Nations Convention Against Ethnic Discrimination, that's uh, third CERD, and then uh, secondly, um, ratify the International Covenant on Civil Rights and uh, Civil and Political Rights. Okay, and uh, thirdly, perhaps you know we should once and for all put a full stop to this continuous reincarnation of the NEP. And um, it should be replaced, as rightly said by all the speakers, um, with a needs-based affirmative action program. Yeah, um, this is where uh, what Dr. Kuo Kiasung brought up might fit in, that uh, we should have an Equality and Equal Opportunities Commission to, to look into things like um, civil service, uh, quotas or proportions. And then, um, okay, the, the big bug there, the Article 153. So what, uh, okay, we've had several different views about that, um, with Harris saying that it is not um, quite the cause of, of all, uh, or, the, or the mother of our problems as we think it is, but still, um, isn't it necessary to, to have uh, correct interpretation of, of the extent of uh, 153, you know, and, and because of the Sedition Act, we're not allowed to bring it up. So, so what does the forum and, you know, um, okay, let, let's take it to the political parties. You know, can, can we get a commitment from the politicians to state their stand quite clearly on what their parties intend to do, and this applies to, of course, um, the DAP, the PKR, FAS, as well as the DN components, as to how these political parties, very soon, in a few months, they're going to ask us for our votes, and we want them to tell us what they do, what are their concrete plans to put an end and to dismantle this institutionalized uh, racism. I'm going to give the floor to our Panelists, uh, first, uh, in the resolutions concerning the <coughs> United Nations Convention, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, they are binding. And, uh, you know, in, in as much as any UN resolution is binding and has an effect on government policy, so that's okay. Uh, as far as 153 is concerned, uh, I think my, my personal opinion is this. As I say, it may be small, it may be narrow, like what Harry says, or uh, you know, it may require correct interpretation. But still, you know, uh, having a, a, a statement like that in the Constitution forever institutionalizes into the, into the life of this nation. And there are always going to be two tiers of citizenship. Right? You can say it's about small things, but I think you know uh, a constitution is a document, as as what Azmi, Dr. Azmi, rightfully have pointed out. There should be vision. There should be uh, you know dignity. And in my opinion, as long as we leave. Uh, room for politicians to interpret, right? And when you've got the judiciary in your pocket, what interpretation are we talking about? I think, you know, uh, a constitution uh, basically conceives the nation, right? And it needs to be conceived right. So, in my opinion, I think, you know, whatever the, uh, the intent, you know, uh, whether it's the affirmative action or what, I think it should be you know, on the basis of true equality, right? And I feel uh, repeal of, you know, uh, an article like that in the Constitution is in keeping with the needs of a modern nation state, right? And we cannot continue uh, to go into the 21st century and on, okay, in this old anachronistic uh, conception of the nation, right? We are all equal. Finished. Let's go on. Right? So, in my opinion, okay, uh, 
I think it's important, but I leave it up to the to the assembly here to decide, you know, how you go about. My very quick take on Article 153 is that it impoverishes, it diminishes the nation. It had its time in uh, history. Uh, that time should have come and gone some time ago. It's not too late. I think that uh, a constitution without Article 153, but ensuring that the uh, needs of all in the country, not based on race or color or region, if, if that's respected, that's good enough. So, you know, I'm for the hard solution, which is to take out Article 153. Yeah, I, I, I've got a two-pronged approach to this problem. I find that the first thing that needs to be got rid of is all the amendments after 1957 that have got no currency at all. Everything that was not agreed to in 1957 have all got to go, which means the new economic policy has got to go. And I think uh, people like Anwar Ibrahim and Khalil Ibrahim have gone on record to, so, to say that they are for the abolition of the new economic policy. After that, after that, the Equality Act has to go hand in hand with the Human Rights Act. Um, the reason why the Equality Act is now in the United Kingdom is because it has to be, it has to fall in line with the European High Human Rights Commission. And so the, the former regulations that is now given way to the Equality Act. So the Equality Act has to go hand in hand with the Human Rights uh, Commission. Okay. So uh, I would like a two-prong two, two approach. If we can do all that and see that all the equality rules come into play, that we have achieved something. You know, uh, I'm quite happy with that. Uh, you know, Aslam, thank you for you know the little you know National Geographic um, speech. <laughs> I must admit, it's very uncomfortable for me to think that Mohammed Muhammad and I share the same five thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was smaller. Distant relative. We are very distant. <laughs> uh, Makes you cringe. Yeah, like, gilly, gilly. <laughs> uh, with regards to your question, yeah, uh, why not? I mean, like, what, what, we, what, what we need is a test case. You know, what we need is a, is a, is a test case. Set and, and, you know, there are good judges in the judiciary. That, maybe not Ramai, but, you know, I don't know. You know, say you know. So, we, we need a test case. But these things, you know, it, it requires, uh, it requires, uh, I mean, you know, the bar, for example, you know, they, you know, they, they, they can go on marches and all those sorts of things with their nice suits and all that, you know, they should go where their money is and do it for free. Mm. You know, because, you know, this kind of things cost money. You know, I, I'm very middle class, I don't lecture and all that stuff, but I think twice if I want to bring a case to court because I don't have enough money. You know, so you know, it's, it's something which, which, which we need the, the legal fraternity to do pro bono. You know, and then we can challenge it, and then we try and get, you know, we try and get test cases, like I said. You know, and who knows? Yes, things, things, things could possibly change. Um, yeah, with regards to the uh, everything else, I mean, like Helen, I mean, I agree with you that if we if we agree to the international laws, then it's for something else which which we can we can we can use. Um, whether you know, the, 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 the trouble is, of course, that to implement it requires other states to force our state to do it, right? We, we ourselves, we have no jurisdiction in the ICJ, for example, but at least it's, it's very important because it gives us the moral authority to say, you know, you promised this. Now, we don't have to go far. Malaysia has been promising, has been promising all sorts of things because they want to be in the Human Rights Commission, the UN Human Rights Commission. They, they you know, when, when council, sorry. You know, so they've been, they've been putting, they've been, they've been putting themselves forward, yeah? 
to, to say that we should be on this council. And um, they've been saying all sorts of things. We should just get what they've been saying. And a lot of the stuff that they say, they don't do. <laughs> and we can use that against them also. That's, a, that's another thing as well. Thank you.